Good morning, everybody. I just just like to make a quick announcement of our Proceeding in Faith golf tournament. It's been two years. Uh, it'd be nice to see everybody in a in a fellowship setting where we all have a good time. Uh, the date is uh, July 16th. Uh, time to be there is 12. Uh, it's uh, 150 per golfer, and uh, there's a dinner opportunity too for 50 bucks a person. Once again, we'd love to see everybody out. It's, it's about fellowship and fun. Uh, if we get some money, that's great, but that's secondary. So if we, uh, for the next two weeks, we'll have a registration uh, booklet outside. We need to get 25 teams in to secure our spot, so we'd like to secure a spot in the next two weeks. We're over halfway there, but we'd like to be there all the way. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bert. Well, good morning. And welcome to our service. My name is Peter, and I have the honor of being the pastor here of this church. And I also want to welcome any visitors who are with us and those who are watching via the live stream. As a church, we're delighted that you've taken the time to uh, check us out and uh, join us this morning. And hopefully, uh, you will be blessed by our service. If you do have any questions about anything, uh, I encourage you to check out the Welcome Center afterwards where our host uh, will answer any questions that you may have. And if you do not own a Bible, we would be more than happy to give you one as our gift to you also at the Welcome Center. Now today's service is going to be very different. We're delighted to have um, the presentation entitled Jesus in the Passover. And our guest, Teddy, who is with us, is from the organization called Jews for Jesus, and he'll be presenting that in this service this morning. Also, we're going to be celebrating communion um, afterwards, and we're going to see how those two tie in so wonderfully well. Again, if uh, children wish to participate, we trust that you as parents have taken the time to explain to them what the elements all represent. And if you are at home, uh, please... uh, have the elements ready. You can have some piece of bread and uh, some juice or wine uh, close by so that you can participate at home with us. And um, also, if uh, today, if you're with us and you just happen to uh, walk in, we're having our first um, luncheon following the service, and we're delighted to be able to do that again. So are you, everyone, there's more than enough food. Everyone is welcome to stay and enjoy. It'll be served indoors, um, and yet um, it'll, be, it'll be a great time. And also this evening, you're welcome back to that presentation that's put on by Professor Jeff Wyma, explaining the document that is uh, the report that is before Synod. So now, as we are about to move into our time of service, let's again ask uh, God uh, to prepare our hearts as we do so just in a moment of, of uh, silent prayer, and that will be followed by our first song. So let's just come before him in silence.
If you're able to stand, please stand as we receive God's greeting. As people of God, we profess that our help is in the name of the Lord who has made the heavens and the earth. It is our God who is with us and greets us with these words, grace and peace be to you from God our Father and from his Son Jesus Christ and from the Holy Spirit. Amen. Again, as normally our custom is, we do greet one another, but again, please respect those that just feel uncomfortable with shaking hands. If so, just put your hands by your side, and if not, extend greetings to one another and welcome them into this place. So our presenter, Teddy, was born and raised in an Ethiopian Orthodox family by his grandparents until the age of 12. He had lost his father when he was six months old, and before he was one year old, his mother left him behind with her parents in Ethiopia. He would not see his mother again until the age of 12. In 1996, at the age of 12, Teddy moved to Toronto to be with his mother. 
Now, despite attending a Pentecostal church with his mother for over five years, Teddy refused to accept Jesus Christ as his personal Lord and Savior. And he thought that by accepting Jesus as a Savior, that he would be betraying his grandparents who faithfully raised him in the Ethiopian Orthodox Jewish tradition. After many years of attending Bible class and learning scripture, his heart was changed after reading Exodus 20, verse 4. He came to believe and understand that Jesus was the only way, the truth, and the life. And it was Jesus that sheltered him and covered him with his blood from everything that he was exposed to growing up without a father or mother in Ethiopia. Over the years, God, as he claims, as he he tells us, was so faithful to him and his wife and Teddy with his wife. I'm probably going to get all these names a little messed up, but I'm going to try. Devorah? All right on. All right. Um, Were missionaries um, with the Jews for Jesus in the Toronto branch. He has been married close to 10 years now, and they have three children. Milaya? Okay. Eight years old. And... Tuvel, yeah, our son at six years old, and Elroy, ooh, the youngest son who is six months old. And uh, so we want to thank Teddy for coming all the way from, I believe Toronto, right, is your hometown? Hometown, city, actually, we should have a moment of silence, shouldn't we? (laughs) Anyways, that's another story, we'll forget that. But anyways, thank you, Teddy, for for being here, and we look forward to your presentation at this time. Thank you. Good morning, church. Thank you, Pastor Peter. Um, We should have a moment of silence. (laughs) I think we need it. Uh, Seems like we've been having that for five years. (laughs) Um, Thank you. You you did very well with the names, by the way. I'll just uh, clarify a little thing. So, as pastors... Um, said I was born in Ethiopian an Orthodox, an Ethiopian Orthodox family by my my grandparents. Um, I'm not Jewish. My wife is Jewish, so is our three kids. So as you can tell, because I didn't grow up Jewish, I have the same problem as you do as pronouncing their name and all that stuff. And the children will be there to correct me. So <laughs> don't feel so bad. Um, so. I just want to share with you a little bit, as we were preparing to share Christ in the Passover, I was pretty confident that, you know, if I miss a step or two, that my wife would be here, because she grew up celebrating Passover all her life, and she would be able to guide me. And last minute, we found out that I would be coming by myself. (laughs) And so you can see I had... You know, I I was depending on my wife for guidance and support. But I should have depended on God from the get-go. And he would guide me and reveal Christ in the Passover with what I know to you. So on the way here, there was a little tremblance of flat air. I had to pull over. And the devil will try, but he won't succeed. Amen? So here I am. Um, It's an honor to be able to serve Christ in the Passover with you. Um, Again, my name is Teddy. I serve as a full-time missionary with Jews for Jesus in Toronto. And it's an honor to be able to share with you about Christ in the Passover. Now, the story of Passover is a central narrative of the Jewish people. It's a story of redemption. It's my story, but it's also your story. But it also points us to the story of the gospel itself. Now, when we say that, some people wonder, Gospel and Passover contradict. But Jesus was Jewish. And more than that, it points us to the Passover story, as I said. Let's turn to Deuteronomy and your Bibles, chapter 16, starting in verse 1. We read. Okay. 
Observe the month of Aviv and celebrate the Passover of the Lord your God. Because in the month of Aviv, he brought you out of Egypt by night. Sacrifice as the Passover to the Lord your God, an animal from your flock or herd, at a place the Lord will choose as his dwelling for his name. Do not eat it with bread made with yeast, but for seven days eat unleavened bread, the bread of affliction, because you left Egypt in a haste, so that all the days of your life you may remember the time of your departure from Egypt. So God commanded Israel to eat unleavened bread for seven days. Passover marks the beginning of a seven-day holiday called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. During this time, Jewish people eat unleavened bread called matzah. I really hope you'll come up to the table, take a look at all these elements, and maybe even try a little bit of matzah. I'm sure you'll say it's pretty good, but trust me, after eating Nothing but matzah for seven days. You'll do anything to get your hand on a bagel or a donut. <laughs> it's just matzah and matzah. So, why no leaven? Well, our ancestors, in the haste to leave Egypt, needed to take the bread with them while it's still flat. An ancient baking. Today, we will call that artisanal baking. A small piece of fermented dough would be added to a fresh batch, causing it to rise and puff up. This is what causes the holes in the loaves of bread, as well as that flavor known as sourdough. Some biblical authors use leaven as a symbol of sin. And it's easy to see why, because just like leaven, a little bit of sin in our life will cause us to puff up with pride and leave our soul sour and full of holes. So at Passover, we remove all leaven from our home as a symbol of removing sins from our life. Apostle Paul applies this very ceremony in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, when he charges to get rid of old yeast so that you may be new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, the Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So once cleansed of leaven, the home is ready for a Passover Seder. Seder means order. Because Passover celebration follows a specific order of service, which is recorded in this book called the Haggadah. Haggadah means the telling. And today we will engage in the Passover story through reading excerpts in the Haggadah, which you'll find in your brochure. So Passover begins with the women at the house. Oh, sorry. <laughs> with the women at the house lighting the candles. She then recites the traditional Hebrew prayer. So I'll say the prayer in Hebrew, and I ask the women to read the prayer over the blessing of the candles, which you'll find in your brochure here. Baruch atah Adonai, Elohim mihalam, amotzeh Aretz. Women, please let's read for the blessing of the candle. All together, please. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us by his commandment and command us to kindle the festival light. Amen. Don't you love the honoring of kindling the light belonging to a woman? Because the Messiah, the light of the world, would be brought into the world through the seed of a woman. The prophet Isaiah foretold, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God is with us, a light to light the Gentiles and glory to the people of Israel. Amen? So there are four acts in the drama of the Passover Seder. So we'll fill our cup four times. First, for the Kurdish cup, or the cup of sanctification. Then comes the cup of plagues. The third cup, the cup of redemption, is the focal point of the entire ceremony. Finally, we come to the fourth cup, the cup of praise, or the cup of halal. 
So Passover takes about four hours of celebration. But I spoke to pastor and we're, <laughs> we're going to try to complete in three and a half, if that's okay with you. <laughs> so the man at the house takes the first cup and recites a blessing for the evening to come. Man, now it's your turn. Let's blessing over the cup. And let's try to be louder than the women, please. <laughs> Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruits of the vine. Amen. In a Jewish home, we always follow the blessing of the fruits of the vine with another for the blessing of the bread. But remember, tonight there's no, or this morning, there is no leavened bread, only matzah. One of the items found on the Passover table is a matzah tosh, which contains three layers of matzah. The man at the house removes the middle layer, recites the blessing. I'll say the prayer in Hebrew again. Feels like you guys are also participating in today's service. It's awesome. Baruch atah Adonai, Elohim mihalam, amatze min aretz. Amen. Men, let's pray over the blessing of the bread, please. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Amen. So the matzah is broken in two. One half is covered in a white cloth and buried. This is called afikomen which is Greek for which that comes later. The children have to search for it and must find it for the story to continue to unfold. So none of the kids are supposed to see this when you're hiding it. Yeah, cover their eye, please. <laughs> <laughs> so the Seder has begun. The youngest child comes forward and asks the meaning of Passover. He chants the traditional four questions. Sounds like this. Manishtanai kol halailot ize halailot. Why is this night different from all other nights? On all other nights, we're not required. We eat leaven or unleavened bread. Why on this night do we eat only unleavened bread? Those of us who know the story of Passover are obligated to respond. So we say, this is because of what the Lord did for me. When he brought me out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, when he redeemed me with a mighty hand and outstretched arm, when he provided the Passover lamb for our family. Our ancestors were instructed to take spotless lamb and to apply its blood to the doorpost of their home. Those who obeyed God's command were spread the ravage of the ten plague, the death of every firstborn son in Egypt. When God saw the blood on our doorpost, death was forced to pass over. And this is where we get the name Passover. In Hebrew, Pesach. In the same way that our ancestors had to apply the blood of the lamb to the doorpost of their home, each one of us must also apply the blood of the Passover lamb to the doorpost of our heart. Amen? The child then comes forward and asks the following three more questions, which you have here. We can read it out together. Why is this night different from all other nights? On all other nights, we eat leaven or unleavened bread. Why on this night do we eat only unleavened bread? On all other nights, we eat vegetable and herb of all kind. Why on this night do we eat only bitter herbs? On all other nights, we're not required to dip the herb once. Why on this night do we dip it twice? On all other nights, we eat sitting upright or reclining. Why on this night do we recline? So Passover is more than a story. It's reenactment. On the first Passover, our ancestors ate their meal with the sandals on their feet 
and staffs in their hand, ready to leave Egypt at a moment's notice. But today, we relax and recline on pillow. You see, in ancient Middle Eastern society, only the free could recline at dinner, only the redeemed. Each Jewish family must recreate the Passover experience, the Exodus experience. Every generation must taste for themselves the bitterness of slavery and must long to savor the sweetness of freedom. This is a Seder plate. Let's try again. <laughs> and a piece of food symbolic of the Passover experience is placed in each of its compartments. The first item we have karpas, which is greens. These greens represent life. But before we eat them, we dip them in salt water, which represent tears of life. By dipping, we're reminded that life without redemption is a life drowned in tears. The next item we have, Ozeret, which is the root of an onion or horseradish root is used. These roots represent the root of life is bitter, and it certainly was for our ancestors in Egypt. Next item we have the marar, which is the bitter herb itself, freshly ground horseradish. Now we're supposed to eat a full teaspoon of horseradish. Any volunteer who would like? <laughs> well, the kids there. <laughs> so like the Hazaret, the Marar brings to our mind how sad life is without redemption. Next item, we have Hazaret, which is apple, cinnamon, raisin, and it tastes delicious. This represents the mortar our ancestors used to make bricks for Pharaoh. Now, you might be wondering, why use such sweet mixture to represent a life of slavery? Well, the rabbi tell us, even in the most difficult circumstances, our life are sweetened by the future redemption. Now, the last two items were added to the Seder in 70 AD. This is a hagiga, a roasted egg, representing a temple sacrifice. The Hagiga is a token of our sorrow over the destruction of the temple. During the Seder, it's sliced, given out, but before we eat it, we dip it in salt water, which represents tears. There's a lot of crying during a Passover Seder. This is a Zorak, which is a shank bone of a lamb. Passover is sometimes known as the feast of the Passover lamb. The lambs that were eaten were a temple sacrifice. But in 70 AD, the, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. So a lamb is usually not served at Passover anymore. So the presence of the egg and the Zorak bring an interesting question to mind. With no altar, no temple, no sacrifice, how is it possible for us to atone for our sins? The rabbi tell us atonement is now made through repentance, prayer, and good deed. But the law of Moses clearly states atonement must be made through blood, and our good deeds can never save us. And today, Sador, this question is left unanswered and unresolved. We now come to the second cup, the cup of plagues. We dip our fingers into our cup and let 10 drops into our plates as we recite the 10 plagues that were poured out upon the Egyptians. We mourn for their loss and express sorrow for their destruction. But there's an important application in this cup. Pharaoh hardened his heart, refusing to listen to God's will, causing death and destruction for those he loves. Living in postmodern society, we also 
fall for the lie that we tell ourselves, that we can define our own truth, and that our personal belief is exactly that, personal. But when we don't lay God's leading in our life, the result can be devastating for everyone around us. After the second cup, we come to the Passover meal. While the delicacies served vary around the world, there's an important place left untouched at our table for the prophet Elijah. Why? Well, it's recorded by the Hebrew prophet Malachi that before the coming of the Messiah, he will be preceded by the prophet Elijah. So during the Seder, a youngest child will go to the door, opens it wide, hoping the prophet will accept our invitation, sit at our table, and announce the coming of the Messiah. But when Jesus spoke of his cousin Yonna, or John the Baptist, he said, if you care to accept it, he himself is Elijah who was to come. And John, upon seeing Jesus, declared, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So the question of atonement has been answered. Redemption from slavery and death and sin is possible not through the blood of the the lambs, but through the blood of the Passover Lamb, the Messiah, Jesus. Amen? After the second cup, we'll have our meal. We'll have uh, the cup of redemption, but we can't proceed just yet. Because earlier, something was broken and buried. Now needs to return back. Daffy Komen. All of the children will search for it, and once it's found, it's returned to the head of the house, who must redeem it or buy it back for a small price. He takes it, breaks it, each person will receive a piece, which is then taken along the third cup, the cup of redemption. This looks familiar, right? This is our origin of our communion service. The rabbis believe the afikomen is a symbol of the last thing that's eaten during Passover, the lamb. Now, there are specific regulations set down by the rabbis in the preparation of the matzah. If you can see, the matzah is striped. Jesus was striped. The prophet Isaiah foretold, would see stripes, we're healed. If we can see, the matzah is also pierced. Jesus was pierced. God speaking to Zacharias declared, they should look upon me whom they have pierced. Now there are, the matzah being unleavened and having sinless nature can certainly remind us of his body. So there are a few things during Passover that we do. We, as I said, it takes a long time. We share the the matzah. It's a, a children atmosphere holiday. Now we come to the third cup, the cup of redemption, as I said. And it was this cup that Jesus said, with this cup, I make a new covenant in my blood. And it was this covenant that was promised to us by God through the prophet Jeremiah when he said, I'll make a new covenant with the the people of Israel in the house of Judah. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers. I will put my laws within them. I will write it on their heart. I'll be their God and they shall be my people. The broken Afi Komen, again, and the cup of redemption are taken together in remembrance of the body and blood 
of the Passover lamb. Our Passover lamb is Jesus, amen? We now come to the fourth cup, which is the cup of Hallel, or the cup of praise. As we drink from this cup, we sing from what's known as Halal Psalms, Psalms 118, 113 to 118. And it might have been this Psalms when we read in the gospel. After dinner, the disciples sang hymns and went out into the garden. Passover is a time of celebration, a time of thanksgiving. Tonight, we give thanks not only because our ancestors were redeemed, but we also have been redeemed from a greater bondage, from death and sin, through the blood of the Messiah. There's a, a video I would like to play for you at this moment. Jesus seemed like he could be the Messiah, but I'm Jewish. The person said to me, have you ever heard of Jews for Jesus? As a Jewish person, when I started to follow Jesus, people would question if you're still Jewish, if you believe in Jesus. What I wish someone had told me when I first came to faith in Jesus is that I could have a thriving Jewish identity and a thriving faith in Jesus together and not have to choose between the two. The reality is, all of the first believers in Jesus were Jewish. They saw him as the promise of the Messiah. I want to invite you to join Jews for Jesus as we relentlessly pursue God's plan for the salvation of the Jewish people. Most Jewish people in the world have never heard the gospel, and together we get to change that. You make it possible for me as a missionary to engage with not yet believing Jewish people and to tell them that God loves them. And in a sense, it's not really us doing it, it's Him doing it. We're just the ones who are carrying the message. Go and tell. That's what Jews for Jesus is best known for. It's that proclamation of the gospel out on the streets, meeting one to one. Come and see. And that is where we invite Jewish people to come into an environment, a community, a small group, a Bible study, and they can see the dynamic of a vibrant community of Jewish believers in Jesus. Love and serve. There's so many needs. And so we go out there lovingly feeding people, even as Jesus fed and met needs, and it opens people up to the gospel. Through your support, we can show Jewish people how beautiful God is, how beautiful Jesus is, and how beautiful the Gospel is. Every week around the world, Jews for Jesus welcomes new Jewish brothers and sisters into the family of Messiah. I'm so thankful for people like you who love the Jewish people and want them to see who Jesus is. If your heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved, you're going to find yourself loving the same things that God loves. You're going to enter into His passion for His people. Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that we've been waiting for. All that the Jewish prophets have talked about, all that God has spoken to us, every Jewish person deserves to hear the truth about Jesus. We found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. Come and see. So on April 15th, Jewish people celebrated Passover and they prayed that the Messiah would come and gather their people in Jerusalem and celebrate Passover together, not knowing that he has already come. So during the Seder, it's usually customary to say, next year in Jerusalem. And believers in Jesus, the Messiah, we also wait for the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So join with me in saying, next year in the new Jerusalem, for our Lord to come back and establish his new kingdom. I'll say it in three, in Hebrew, I'm sure you'll know when. Ahad, Shtaim, Shalosh. Next year in the new Jerusalem. Just want to share with you a little bit of a testimony of my wife and myself as well. 
As I said, my wife is Jewish, uh, I'm not. So she grew up for over 25 years celebrating Passover without seeing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to this Passover meal celebrations. And um, it's a woman that you guys are actually familiar with, Laura Barron and Andrew Barron. They used to come to this uh, church quite often as the missionary with Jews for Jesus. And um, when my wife came back from Israel as a believer, she was looking for a community for us to have fellowship together with other believers. And she reached out to Jews for Jesus on Facebook. And Laura Barron met her the next day. And then after many times of you know, being in their home, celebrating the different Passover and her discipling to my wife, she invited her to one of the Passover presentation at a church. And that day, my wife was able to see our Lord and Savior and to the Passover meal that she was celebrating all her life that she wasn't able to see before. And it was right at that moment, she ran out, called eight of her siblings, it's a big family, and she said, in Israel, in Israel, they all live in Israel, say, you won't believe what I just saw. And she proclaimed the gospel to them, and now, thank God, eight of her, uh, four of her eight siblings are believers in the Messiah. And this is a very challenging um, in Israel, not only in Israel, in Toronto, in New York. Um, the Jewish people, less than 1% of them have heard of the gospel. So as missionaries with my wife and I in Toronto, we know that there is a, a a lot of work and challenging, but we, we know that God will prepare their heart for those who are willing to hear, so for those who will stop and hear of the gospel. So please pray for us. Um, pray for our missionaries in Ukraine. Um, and share another testimony with you. Currently, most of our missionaries are on the border of Ukraine and uh, Poland, taking people over. Um, there are many people who've come to the Lord on that journey. There's a woman of survivor of a Holocaust that they were able to pick her up from Ukraine. And as they drove her to Poland, they proclaimed the gospel to her. And that six, seven hour drive, she believed and accepted Christ as her personal savior. So these are in the ways that God is working with Jews for Jesus. Um, let's pray, please. Thank you, Lord, for giving me this opportunity to be before your people and present Christ in the Passover. I pray, Lord, that we will each see our own redemption story, Lord, how you've redeemed us from death and sin. Lord, everyone here and everyone that is watching knows their own personal story, Lord, from what kind of condition from what kind of life that you brought them out of, Lord? I know mine. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for your mercy, Lord. I pray that you will use us all to proclaim the gospel, Lord. To take it, to take this light into this dark world, Lord, that we seem that we're surrounded and your people are surrounded facing Different kind of challenges, war, Lord. Only your word can be a light and can save. I thank you for this moment with my brothers and sisters, Lord. I pray you watch over us and protect us. In Jesus' name, amen. for that, Teddy. We're uh, now uh, going to respond in a song, uh, What a Beautiful Name It Is.
beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name. My name is Alan. I'm a deacon here, and the first offering today is for the church and its ministries, and the second offering is for Jews for Jesus. May God bless your giving.
Almighty God, to you our hearts are open. We long for more than what this world provides. No shallow spring will ever satisfy us. But your river deep floods all On the night in which Jesus was betrayed and arrested, he was celebrating the Passover meal with his disciples in the upper room. And it was during this meal that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper because, as we have just witnessed, the Passover celebration itself pointed to Jesus. The first Passover celebration is described in Exodus 12, where the Hebrew people were, Egypt, were in captivity by Egypt and were instructed to find a year-old male lamb without defect and take it into their home to care for it for four days. Then everyone was to slay their lambs and smear the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of their homes. And that evening the angel of death were to pass over, and all homes that did not have the blood of the lamb on the doorpost lost the firstborn son to death. Every Hebrew family was to roast and to eat the lamb together with unleavened bread and bitter herbs and be ready to leave Egypt in haste. After the angel of death had passed over Egypt, killing the firstborn males of the children of Israel, Pharaoh finally released the Hebrew slaves. And God instructed his people to celebrate this Passover meal every year in remembrance of what he had done for them. Now, the Jewish Mishnah is a collection of rabbi teachings, tells us that in the time of Jesus, in the days of Jesus when he walked the streets of Jerusalem and as such, the slaughtering of the lambs for the Passover began at 3 p.m. on Friday at the temple. The large group of people waiting to sacrifice their lambs were divided into three groups, and they would enter into the temple courts at different times. When each group entered the court, the gates would be closed behind them. There would be a long blast from the ram's horn, and then the sacrifices would begin. The people came forward in long rows, and priests held basins of silver and gold. Each Israelite slaughtered their own lamb, and the priest would catch the blood in the basin and pour the blood at the base of the altar as a symbol that their sins had been atoned for. The worshiper then would then leave with the animal over his shoulders and would turn home to eat the lamb, along with unleavened bread, bitter herbs, and together as a family they would celebrate the Passover. And as we heard, this wasn't a quick meal. 
At the table, there would be a folded napkin, which we saw, which was used to hide a piece of bread called the afikomen, which was broken off a piece of unleavened bread, and it was placed inside the napkin, as we had seen. And then it was hidden, hidden away. The children then would search for it, and when it was found, it would be the last thing eaten in the Passover meal. And we know that it was this piece of bread, the afikomen, that Jesus held and said, Take, eat, this is my body. See, Jesus compared his own body to the afikomen, which was taken from the napkin. Think about it. The afikomen was hidden, was hiding away, just as Jesus would be hidden in the grave until his resurrection three days later. And following the meal, there would be the third cup of wine, which is the cup of redemption with outstretched arms. It was this cup, as we heard, that Jesus gave thanks, gave to his disciples and said, this is the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So in the Passover, Jesus now institutes the Lord's Supper with specific instructions to remember everything he did. Everything about the Lord's Supper has a story, a significant meaning, as did the Passover. As we heard, the children were encouraged to be not only a part of it, but an integral part, as they would ask questions, saying, why of all things on this night is this different? Why are we eating this? Why are we doing this? And same thing, the Lord's Supper gives us an opportunity to tell our children about the great deliverance, not out of bondage of Egypt, but out of uh, deliverance over sin and death that has come through Christ. See, every time we hold the bread, we are reminded that Jesus is the living bread who was sacrificed for our sins. The cup that we hold reminds us that his blood was shed and that Jesus' death on the cross was not just about removing sin, it was also about giving us eternal life. Now we are to tell this story in a very personal way because we ourselves have been redeemed. Just as in the Passover, they weren't to say our ancestors, but they were to say, I was a slave. I was in bondage. God led me. And the same thing in the Lord's Supper. We can make it very personal because we are the ones who are redeemed. So every time we come to the table, we renew our commitment to Jesus. We acknowledge our need for him and humbly come before him with gratitude, accepting the grace given to us, his body, his blood, for our redemption. This is a holy celebration, and the story of Jesus' love and sacrifice needs to be retold again and again for all the generations to come. At this time, I will invite our elders to come forward who will be serving you, and um, if you just hang on to the peace, and then we will eat it all together um, at the right time.
Yes, he's got one. Take and eat, remember and believe that the body of Christ was given for the complete forgiveness of all of our sins. Then Jesus took the third cup, the cup of redemption, and said, This is a covenant in my blood which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink, remember and believe that the precious blood of Jesus Christ was shed 
for the complete forgiveness of all of our sins. Now with your cup, I would ask if you're good to pass it down to the ends and then our two of our elders will collect them in the bowls. Passover celebration they sang from I believe it was Psalm 113 to 118 Um, uh, the words were put in tune and uh, as we heard after celebrating the Passover Jesus and his disciples sang him so it's only fitting appropriate that after the celebration that we also honor God as we worship him through the song there is a redeemer would you please stand as we sing this Sing our closing song is a revelation song, very fitting to close out our service. And again, um, you're reminded that we do have a luncheon 
that's welcome for everyone. So if you can, please stay. Now receive the blessing of our Lord Jesus Christ and go forth from this place encouraged in his name and living in his strength. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Amen. Struck wonder at the mansion.